audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. The story. When I look back, I can see patterns of behaviour that were very much like the way I behaved as a child in response to mum trying to relate to me. But the acting out always has something behind it. And behind my acting out was that longing for her to say, you matter to me. And I don't ever remember my mum telling me that she loved me. G'day, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Well, Karen Mace is originally from Tasmania and went on to serve as a missionary in South America, along with her husband and children. It was there that tragedy struck for her family, which caused issues from her troubled childhood to resurface. Sadly, this led to a crisis of faith that lasted for several years. Karen is the author of the book Healing Begins in the Heart and she'll share her story today as she has a chat with Eric Scatterbo. Karen Mace, welcome to the program. Thank you, Eric. It's really great to be here. Glad to have you with us and you're coming to us from Tasmania at the moment in your home? Yes, from Grindelwald, Tasmania. Beautiful place to be. Great. Glad to have you with us. And so we're going to talk about the tragedy that happened in South America, in Ecuador. But before we do that, we want to go back to your childhood because I understand that some of the events from your childhood really played a role later in your life when you went through that crisis of faith. So should we start with your childhood? Yeah, sure. I'm happy for us to do that. Okay. Where should we begin? Well, when I was 18 months old, mum and dad divorced and brought me to Tasmania, Mm -hmm. since this is where I am now. We were in Victoria when I was born. Mm -hmm. And um, my sister and I were separated at that time. She was two years older than I was. I got to live with grandma. She got to go and live with an aunt in Victoria. So quite a bit of separation as, you know, not just that physical sibling separation, but the distance as well. Mm -hmm. So I went to live with grandma, which for a a few years was wonderful. And I think it's really important to state that an attachment figure, someone who is caring and who loves you, who plays a special part in being in your life in a way that you can trust them, Mm -hmm. uh, is significant for a child. And grandma was that to me for a few years. Mm -hmm. But then I went to live with mum. Can Uh, we back up a little bit? I just wanted to find out why were you dropped off at your grandparents? What happened before that? Mm, That's a good question. Uh, Mum and dad met when they were in the armed forces and they married, but it wasn't a very good, it wasn't a very strong marriage. Mm. They were both into drinking. Dad was a gambler as well. And mum spent a lot of time meeting up with one of her brothers who was an alcoholic. He lived in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. That didn't go down well with with dad. But the Mm. thing is, when I asked mum why she dropped us off, what happened? She said, well, I married your father to have two children and I had you and your sister. And so I left. I wanted to live my own life. I wanted to do something for myself. Oh, so you're saying she didn't have any interest in being a mother? That's how I interpreted it, Eric. I didn't actually Hmm. ask that question. But I'm guessing that for those few years she left me with grandma that there wasn't really an interest in being a mother because she spent very little time visiting me and or visiting my sister in Victoria. I don't actually remember even realising I had a mother as such other than grandma Mm. (laughs) until I was around three and this person was introduced as my mother. Oh, wow. Yeah, I kind of... You're meeting your mother... Seemingly like for the first time when you're three? Yeah, that's what it seemed like to me because yeah. grandma had been my mother. She yeah. was the one I related to as mum, mm-hmm. even though I called her grandma. And then I would take umbrage at mum trying to step in and do the things that grandma used to do. And I can remember one time mum was there and she was it was her job to get me up for school. Mm-hmm. And I guess I wanted to punish her somewhat for stepping into a role that I believed grandma had. I don't Mm. know, but as I look back, you know, I try to think about that. Yeah. And I pretended I was dead. Oh, wow. I did. So (laughs) that she would just leave me alone. 
And I can remember still her dragging me out of bed by the arm, dragging me out to the lounge room. And in those days, we had hair brushes with very firm um, backs. You know, there was the yeah. brush and a very, yeah. very solid back that gave mm-hmm. a really good whack. I think I can kind of guess where this is going toward. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway, I was still playing dead and pretending I would not stand up. I can still remember this. This is oh, wow. serious. I was yeah. about five then, though. Yeah. And mum hit me so hard that she broke the hairbrush. Oh, wow. And then grandma intervened. And mm. immediately, of course, I threw myself at grandma and around her legs. Mm. And I can still remember grandma railing at mum for what she had done, but mm. I don't remember the words. Yeah. And mum didn't stay very long after that. So it, it wasn't an easy relationship. Yeah, I was going to ask you, she initially didn't have an interest in being a mother. So mm. she was out of your life. So then you attached in a healthy way to your grandmother who nurtured yeah. you. But then she came back into the picture. Why did she come back in? Well, she just dropped in. Oh, okay. She, she was drop just in, yes. dropping by. She just dropped by and she would stay for a day or two. Um, she would bring her latest boyfriend with her. And so I, I knew this person was coming, but when I was told she was my mother, it didn't make sense to me mm. because I had an understanding of what a mother should be, mm-hmm. you know, from the way yeah. mothers related to my friends mm-hmm. yeah. and the way grandma related to me. And mum wasn't doing that. Yeah. So it was really confusing for me. Oh, I imagine. Yeah. Now we should say, fast forwarding, you are a counselor now. So you can kind of go back and analyze what was going on. And there is a counseling term for this. When you have an emotionally absent parent, Hmm. uh, what, what is that called and what effect does this have on you? Well, when you have an emotionally absent parent, there is no real connection with that parent. Mm -hmm. There's no attunement, uh, as we call it, emotionally. So there's a longing in the the child to be seen, to be heard. That's every child. That's every child. Mm -hmm. We all have a longing to be seen and to be heard and to be loved. That's how God's designed us. Mm -hmm. And and to have that connection, that's how God's designed us. Mm -hmm. And so deep down, we know that the parent loves us, but we want to feel it. We want to have them look in our eyes and relate to us emotionally because that's a significant thing, Mm. looking at each other in the eyes. We have, our brain has that way of connecting emotionally that's really significant and important. Mm. So I didn't have that. So there wasn't a secure attachment, as you call it, Mm. with my mother, yet there was with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And that actually caused a little bit of friction between mum and grandma at times, I think. Mm -hmm. So... um, That, sadly, I carried through with me into my adult life. And we do this as children. We carry these things that happen to us as children Mm -hmm. into our adult life. And so this sense of being abandoned by my mother for a start, even though I didn't realise that was what was going on, there is that sense of being rejected, being Mm. abandoned. And that at a spiritual level is really significant for us because that's not how God's made us to be. And we have that longing to belong to this person who is our parent. That's how God's made us. So I didn't have that. And Mm. that causes you to behave in certain ways in your adulthood. It impacts your thinking, it Mm -hmm. impacts your behavior and your emotional response to whatever is going on in your life. Mm -hmm. And if you have that insecure attachment to someone Mm -hmm. and then you try and form relationships as you're older, which I did, you know, when with my husband, of course, Mm -hmm. and with my own children, When I look back, I can see patterns of behavior that were very much like the way I behaved as a child in Mm. response to mum trying to relate to me. Mm. So um, I became a very angry person Mm -hmm. because what I did with mum was I, I was angry with her. I would act out a lot, but the acting out always has something behind it. 
-hmm. And behind my acting out was that longing for her to say, you matter to me. Mm. I just want to wrap my arms around you and hug you. And I don't remember mum doing that. Mm. I don't ever remember my mum telling me that she Mm. loved me. Mm. Grandma did. I still remember that. Thank goodness for grandma. Yeah, thank goodness for grandma. You're listening to The Story. Today, Eric Scadabo is chatting with Karen Mace, who's the author of the book, Healing Begins in the Heart. As we're hearing, there were significant issues in her childhood in regards to her relationship with her mother that would later spell trouble for her down the road, especially after experiencing a family tragedy. We'll hear more of Karen's story when we return. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401 132 888. Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax and this is The Story. We're back with more of Karen Mace in Tasmania sharing her story. As we heard before the break, when Karen was growing up, she never felt loved by her mother and felt abandoned by her parents when they dropped her off to live at her grandmother's. As we'll hear, these childhood scars would later manifest themselves in adulthood when tragedy struck. Now, here's more of Karen sharing her story. And I was going to ask you, how about faith and spirituality? Did you know anything about God at this point when you're growing up? When I was young, we went to church. We um, went to to mass regularly. Grandma mm-hmm. was quite strong, I think, in, in her faith, and mm-hmm. she used to take care of the little church there at Williamsford, and I would go down and help her. So um, I was brought up in the Catholic faith, but it, it was a very strong what was then Irish Catholic. So there wasn't an understanding of having an individual relationship with God. Mm-hmm. I was very good at going to confession and going to communion, and I really wanted God to approve of me. Which would be completely understandable given what you've gone through. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet it just seemed that everything I learned told me that I had to perform, I had to be a certain way, I had to meet certain standards, and I just struggled so much with that. I never felt good enough. I never Mm -hmm. felt that I measured up. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, I do see now that that would have gone right back to being abandoned, being mm, yeah. rejected yeah. by both mum and dad, really, because why would dad let mum take me away? What was wrong with me that dad didn't try to stop it? That's the child thinking. Yeah. But I mean, you hear of children having parents separate, but you normally go with one or the other, mm. but they both left you. Well, literally, they left you with mm. grandma. Yeah. That's right. They did. They left me with grandma. But again, as I said, I praise God for grandma. Amen. <laughs> who gave me that, that Thank security. God for grandmas. Yeah. Sadly, my sister didn't have that same foundation that I had of, mm. of knowing that I was cared for by someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but even so, parents are really important in a child's life. Mm-hmm. And that sense of not being good enough for mum or for dad carried through to a lot of my relationships and when our girls died that was a really big thing for me Mm. eric yeah it came back in full force even Mm. though i've been a christian for a few years okay we're going to get to the tragedy that happened in south america but first let's find out how did you become a christian I left nursing when I was at the Royal Hobart for a while because of issues between um, mum and me. But eventually I went back and I went to the Mersey Hospital in La Trobe Mm -hmm. in Tasmania and I met my now husband there. He took an interest in me. I wasn't a Christian by any means at the time, but he invited me to a Leighton Ford crusade. (laughs) And I went because I liked him, but I don't really (laughs) remember much about it. (laughs) And anyway, he um, 
continued to invite me to things and eventually he invited me to the Salvation Army, which was quite an odd thing, I thought, because I had this strong sense that I needed to be a Catholic in order to get to heaven. That mm -hmm. was the understanding I had. So when he took me to the Salvation Army, I was kind of blown away by everything that was going on there. The people were so kind and welcoming and um, invited me into their lives. But not only that, I was hearing things I hadn't heard before about God and about what it was to be a a Christian and not just a member of a denomination. Mm -hmm. And then eventually in one lovely January, Ross and I headed out to the bluff at Devonport on his motorbike with our fish and chips. And while we were there chatting about things, he just said to me, do you want to give your life to Jesus? And I went, oh, well, I suppose so. I'm, huh. I might as well because I'm not doing so good at it. So... <laughs> Maybe he'll be able to do something better. But it was from there, even just me saying yes like that, God stepped in and started showing mm. me things I'd, I'd never learned before mm -hmm. about relationship. And I started reading the Bible, which I had never done before because that wasn't something we did. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing what I started to learn. I even started to learn how to relate better to my mum Things like forgiveness mm -hmm. were, you know, started to show up. Lots of things that yeah. I had never learned before started to happen. And my mm -hmm. relationship improved with mum to some degree, although she was not happy about me becoming a Christian. Hmm. Well, that's wonderful that your now husband led you to the Lord way back then. So that's fantastic. Yeah. That's good for your relationship. And then eventually the two of you become missionaries. How did that come about? Yes, well, that's a story in itself. But when um, Ross eventually asked me to marry him, I said yes. And I said, but you know what? I'm a bit concerned about this going out to be missionaries and going to deep, dark Africa. I said, I'm really not into that. And oh. he said, oh, no, we won't be doing anything like that. You know, I'm sure we won't. <laughs> <laughs> and then a few years later, well, we didn't go to deep, dark Africa, but we just really felt the call of God on our lives to go to South America. And that mm -hmm. came through a couple, Charles and Val Gray, who were well known in um, mm -hmm. what was then HCJB, which is now... Reach Beyond. They were very much involved in that and they were great. So um, we heard them speak and I knew that God was calling us about six months before Ross did, actually. Mm -hmm. It took a while for him to get the message, so I had to wait <laughs> for that to happen. But he did eventually. And <laughs> Which, how ironic is that? He's the one that led you to the Lord, but yet yeah. you wanted to become the missionary first before him. I know, mm -hmm. even though it was me who said no, no to that. Thank you very much. But Well, God obviously yeah. had been working on your heart. Yeah, he had. And as I said, I'd, I'd learned so much more about what it meant to have a relationship with God. And mm. I, I thought I had dealt with a lot of stuff, but really I hadn't, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. from my past. And that was to come later, a lot later, really. And it was after our girls died that God started to do that. But even when we were at um, Bible Training College, at the Missionary Training College at St. Leonard's here, which was WIC mm -hmm. then, God was doing a lot of things. And I thought then that we'd really sorted out this God is my father thing because that was something that was constantly ebbing and flowing, my assurance and then my doubt, my, yes, okay, I really believe this, and then I doubt again that he could really love me. Oh. I often would think, gosh, you know, if I get to heaven, God is He's going to turn me away. He doesn't want me there. Um, because I'm just not good enough. And that was a recurring theme, even when we were at Bible college. So even though you knew that becoming a missionary was what God wanted you to do, mm. you still, because of your past, still mm -hmm. felt somehow you weren't good enough in God's eyes. Yeah, that's right. I did. And mm. I I had a lot of doubts. I had even a little bit of depression at college mm -hmm. because... Of, of those doubts. It was quite a significant spiritual battle for me mm -hmm. there. And yeah. having come out of a place where 
we used to, when going to church on Fridays from the school that I used to go to when I was young, we used to miss the cracks in the sidewalk as we were walking because if you trod on the cracks, that meant the devil would get you. So oh, I really? had a big fear of Satan. Mm -hmm. And that really kept cropping up a lot during my time at Bible college. I had quite significant spiritual battles mm. when we were there. Mm. Okay, and then you finished your Bible training and your training to become mm -hmm. missionaries, including Spanish language training. Yes. And you went to Ecuador with HCJB mm -hmm. World Radio, as it was known at that time. Mm. Tell us about life in Ecuador and then uh, leading up to the tragedy. Yeah, well, when we first went to Ecuador, we our time was in Shell, down in the on the edge of the jungle. Um, Ross, being a, an operating theatre nurse, spent a lot of time helping those who were there bring the operating theatres up to an acceptable standard, I suppose, and an understanding of what the standards are in operating theatres. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of work with people helping them understand the infection control side of things because I was an infection control nurse before we went. And also I was doing um, Spanish language Bible studies with some of the ladies from the military base there. But when we got down to show, we discovered that I was pregnant again with our third daughter. We had mm -hmm. Miriam and Sarah with us, mm -hmm. but I was pregnant again with our third daughter and we hadn't expected that to happen. And we had Ileana down in Shell because at the time we couldn't get to Quito because there was so much fog and mist and mm. rain that the planes couldn't fly, the MAF planes couldn't fly, and we couldn't go by road because there were landslides. Oh, so. Wow. But I had a great team of mm. doctors and Ross, it was a beautiful thing for him. He scrubbed in as a nurse and um, oh. he received Illy when she was born by caesarean. So that yeah. was special. And she seemed like a special gift from God mm. to us. And I suppose that's why when things happened later, those things were going through my mind as well. Well, mm. God, can I really believe the things that I thought you said to me? Yeah. So we were, we were there for a while mm -hmm. um, and then Illy had some odd little things happening to her and we weren't quite sure what it was, but we decided to come back to Australia for an early home ministry assignment. And while we were here, we discovered that she had a kink ureter, which caused really significant kidney infections. Mm. So she had to have surgery. So in, in essence, it was really good that, that we came back when we did because she wouldn't have been able to have that surgery in mm. in Quito. There wasn't the expertise there. And during that time, we weren't quite sure about going back. We really felt that our time in Shell had finished. Um, and then Ross was offered the um, co-directorship of medical caravans, and that would put us in, in Quito. That's where we would be living. Mm -hmm. And we thought that that sounded like something God wanted us to do. So we did. We, we went back eventually. We were home for about 18 months because we had to stay longer than anticipated to make sure Illy was over her surgery. Mm -hmm. So we went back and we settled in there. And um, we hadn't been back very long when we went out to PIFA, which was the old antenna farm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I remember and being out there. Yeah. And um, the girls and Ross were swimming and I was it was kind of drizzly, so I was sitting in one of the little dressing rooms near the pool mm -hmm. and I was reading and then I heard a shout and Illy had nearly drowned. Mm -hmm. And so she had been passed out to a friend of ours who was there, Trish, and she, you know, got rid of the water and everything. It was pretty pretty full on. And Every now and again, a little while later, Illy would just sit on my knee and she'd put a little hands on my cheeks and she'd pat them and she'd say, I nearly drowned, Mummy, didn't no. I? I nearly no. drowned, but God saved me, Mummy, didn't he? And she was only not quite three when she, she was very good vocabulary-wise, having mm. two big sisters, so she could say yeah. that. Um, and another time with, with Illy, she was really precious. We were doing something else happened and... Um, she was in danger and I remember doing something and she, she was okay, but I remember saying to God, oh, God, please, please.
please don't take my baby from me. And just a few days later, both Illy and Sarah died. So um, it was a struggle. We went back believing God had sent us back for a purpose. And I remember before we went out the first time that he reassured me when I had doubts that he would be with me and he would smooth the path for us. And I was very confident that he was. And even, you know, Illy being safe from drowning and this other little incident where she was safe and then that was it. Hmm. On the 20th of November in 1993, Illy and Sarah died and um, it threw my whole life into chaos. Hmm. In that very night, those voices started in my head again. Mm -hmm. You deserve this. You're a bad mother. I mean, it's a tragedy as it is. Uh, without getting too much into the details, there was a gas leak. Yeah, it was a gas hot water heater that mm -hmm. um, the importing company had done something with the um, pilot lights so that they they went out when they shouldn't have gone out. And so the gas leaked and your, yeah. your two daughters died from the gas leak. That's right, yeah. Sadly, as we just heard, Karen Mace experienced a horrific tragedy with the death of her two daughters in South America. But, as we'll hear next time, a second layer of the tragedy occurs when their deaths stir up issues from Karen's own childhood and feelings of doubts and insecurities begin to creep in. We invite you to join us again next time when Karen will share more of her story and how God's love finally breaks through to her troubled heart. Karen is the author of the book, Healing Begins in the Heart. Meanwhile, to find out more about Karen and her book, her website is karenmace.com. That's karenmace, M-A-C-E, dot com. Finally, we'll end today with some reassuring verses from the book of Psalms for when life doesn't make sense and you're going through a devastating experience like Karen did. Psalm 34 and 147. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wombs. And finally, the psalmist cries out, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart forever. It's comforting words for all of us when going through tough times. Well, until next time, when we'll hear part two of Karen's story, I'm Jimmy Colfax, encouraging you to share your story with someone today. Next time on The Story. The pain was so deep, I even felt a physical pain, but the mental anguish was horrific, and I didn't feel I had, I could turn to God for comfort either. I felt that He had rejected me, and that he had abandoned me, just as mum and dad abandoned me when I was little. That was the thinking that was going on in my head. Karen Mace is originally from Tasmania and went on to serve as a missionary in South America. It was there that tragedy struck for her family, which sent Karen into a crisis of faith that lasted for several years. Also, it stirred up painful issues from her childhood before God's love eventually broke through. Karen Mace will continue to share her story next time. The story. the story. Just another way vision is connecting faith to life. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.